Cross Border Interview is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country called Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today on the show, we are honored to be sitting down with Lunenburg, Nova Scotia Mayor Jamie Myra. But before we do that, before we get into our interview with the mayor, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for everyone who is tuning in day after day, week after week, and listening to me and my guests talk about municipal issues. The president of the FCM, Scott Pierce, says it the best. Municipalities are the government of proximity, but they don't often get the coverage they need. So this show is hopefully highlighting some of the great work, the great people, the great leaders in our communities. So if you can, do us a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this right now so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews. It does help us get the word out, but it also shows me and my guests that municipalities do matter. And I want to make sure people know that this is where municipalities truly matter. Now, on to our interview with the mayor. Jamie, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about yourself and your community. But I want to start with sort of a generic question, but it's an overarching question of why you decided to get involved in municipal politics. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jamie? It probably came from my dad. My dad was always involved in the Chamber of Commerce level, the Lunenburg Business Development Corp community. They had a they had a board of trade and, and that type of thing. Did my dad was the president of the golf course, the curling club. He was an active member in the fire hall for over 30 years. So the first time I started to give back, I'd say was the late eighties when I as well joined the Lunenburg and district volunteer fire department. And then it went from there. And then I served a, did a few different terms at the board of trade, went through the chair of the curling club and actually uh, sat on council for 12 years in the early 2000s. So that's a that's a good jumping off point because you did serve from 2000 to 2012. There's a brief hiatus, but in August of this year, you decided that I wanted to come back for more because I think municipal politics is as fun as Chris does as well. So what was the desire to get back involved in 2023 when that by-election did come up for mayor? I guess I've been back involved in like town issues since about 2017 when I got re-involved at the board of trade level and I, I slowly became vice president. And then I was, I was currently, I was the active pres, acting president for, I guess, my second full term when this position became, a by-election came up, I guess. And I guess what happened was I, I had a few disagreements with the current group, you know, most 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 concerning was the former mayor that, that that stepped aside, and I'm one of those people that if you're going to run your mouth and you know put your money where your mouth is, so I had a lot to say, quite honestly, back in the spring, about back in the spring and even in the fall of last year about some of the things uh, they were trying to do. And as president of the board of trade and as the leader of the business community at the time, we weren't happy and we felt we weren't being listened to. So when the position came up, I heard different names thrown around that we're going to run. So back, I guess, mid-May, uh, I just decided after talking to my family that I'm going to give this a shot. And if I lose, I lose. But, you know, I uh, so I threw my name in the ring and uh, formed a very strong team. And uh, we did very well. So you, you've been in the new position as mayor for uh, almost two months now, August till October when we're recording this. Um I, I got to ask a weird question. I didn't prepare you for this, but it's kind of an interesting question, I think. How much has municipal governance and politics changed since when you first were elected in 2000 to when you just were reelected? Are the issues the same or are the uh, challenges different from when you were in 2000, 2012 to 2023? Well, the challenges of a small town have always been large. I mean, that's why so many small towns either fold or they get themselves in financial trouble. Lunenburg's been very fortunate in a way. Back in 96, we were listed as a UNESCO site, which there's only two in North America of active towns or villages or cities, us in old Quebec City. So that was a great thing. It was sort of a fallback, but I will say because of the increase in tourism, the love of the community. So, in, so 
uh, more, uh, you know, housing is crazy in Lunenburg. Infrastructure has certainly failed over the last 20 to 25 years slowly. And we were noticing that even towards the end of my first time on council that we were starting to need to do more work at the end of every year than we actually had money for. Uh, so that's the biggest, the biggest difference is things cost a lot more money. <laughs> and when I was on council previously, you always had three to five companies almost fighting for your work. So you'd always get decent pricing when you send an RFP out. Now the big difference is, which I, I was shocked the last, say six weeks that I've been mayor, we're, we've been sending RFPs out with no responses. So, and that's, and people are aware of that. So that's the bad thing. So then if they're the only one responding and you have to get it done, you, you know how competition works. So you might not be paying the fairest or best price for your citizens, but it, it you know, it, it's the world we're living in right now in probably the, you know, the world, but Atlantic Canada really seems to be struggling with tradesmen and people that do the type of work that we're looking for, people that lay sidewalks, do roads, that type of work seems very limited right now. So we're going to talk about the town in a few minutes, but I want to stick on you for a few seconds, because while you're only six weeks into the new position as mayor, um, you're dealing with a lot of heavy stuff. Now, I've had the pleasure of going through and watching some of your previous council meetings over the last few weeks and just to see what the issues are and how, you're, how your council's dealing with them. How important is it to, for you to sort of understand that there is a weight and responsibility on your shoulders every time you walk into that council chambers, that the decisions you make are going to impact your residents, whether it be through budget, service level upgrades, whether it be even through RFPs, tendering of RFPs, and potentially looking at what's going to be financially viable for our community. That's not going to do it on the backs of our communities of growing it. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers? I take the position that I currently hold very seriously. I, I think that everybody sitting around that table takes their position very seriously. I think that that might be a misnomer that was driving the community at times, but I've worked with, you know, I have the pleasure of working with these people for six or seven weeks directly and indirectly for about a month before that when I won the election. And everybody in that room, whether you're at the side of the table that I'm now sitting on and sharing, or you're sitting in the audience, I think we're all in that room with the best interest of Lunenburg at heart. Uh, we just have different ways of showing it or going about it, and that's just human nature. Uh, I think our big thing right now is, and we're trying to do a better job or, or trying to do it the way the public would like to see it done. We're trying to communicate a bit differently, trying to get the residents a bit more involved, keep them updated every time we try to do something. We're, you know, our Facebook page is very active and things like that. So I take my role very serious. I ran on communication as my number one campaign uh, promise, connecting community and council, which I intend to try to do. And I, and I think that both sides of that room, and we're not really sides, we're all here for the same purpose, but both, you know, the way we sit, both sides of the room are all there for the same reasons. And we all have to understand that and accept each other's opinions, which in a small community is difficult because it's very personal in a small community because you know each other so well and, and you see each other every day. Like you see each other at the post office, the drugstore. So you can't, you know, if you're a, an MP in this riding, you serve a big riding. So you might not see your constituents ever in your four years. Whereas I see my constituents every day, I leave my house. So that, that brings up a good question is how, how, because you, you, you tried to figure out the balance of a personal life and a private life of a counselor from 2000 to 2012, because you don't go off to Halifax to do your job. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You're in your community 24 seven. So if you go to the grocery store, people will approach you. If you go yeah. to a park, people <laughs> approach you. If you go out with your family, people know who you are. Um, how how are you going to try and balance that aspect of the job? Because I can imagine there's days that you know it, once you step out of your house, you're you're the mayor. But there's days that you just want to be Jamie. I'm assuming, correct? Yes. Well, there's uh, in the last six weeks, there's been a lot of say Saturday evenings because I own a business as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of days late on a Saturday. I might leave a bit early. My wife and I just go away. Like we were in White Point Beach last weekend. I'm Jamie there and I can, you know, maybe act the way I want to act there in the cottage or I can go golfing there and I'm not 
you know, approached all the time and around town. I will say, and I don't know if it's a, it's a, it's sort of like a honeymoon stage, but right now people are sort of been very professional. They've been staying away from my personal business because I asked them to do that. I am having a couple open houses here in my office starting the first one this Friday. So I'm trying to make myself more accessible than previous people in this role. And, uh, but I want to be accessible and I, and I am accessible 24 seven because that's what a small town is like, but I want people to realize that I'm accessible 24 seven if you really need me, but I'm accessible a lot. Here's where I'm here. Come see me, call me, but you know, Friday night at 11 o'clock, please don't call me and rave about your potholes. Right. And I will take your call because that's, that's what I learned from, I guess, my father as well. He, he always took people's calls when he was like the president or whatever. But again, people have been very respectful so far, both on my team and within the community. And again, it could be a honeymoon phase. I mean, it's still kind of funny because when I go to the like I know all the restaurant owners and all the bar owners. And so when I go out with my wife or even go out for a lunch with somebody, you know, I get a few little funny shots thrown at me or jabs and it's joking. Right. So it is, it, it, it's new, but usually everything new usually, you know, gets old. So uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering how long this stays new, but uh, uh, they, the, every, everything's been great. And I, and I, and I have the staff here told I'm going to be here. I come over to my office, which I'm in right now. I have it fixed up to be my own. It is my office. I come over every day around 11, 30, quarter to 12, spend about an hour to two every day here doing things like this, doing mayor stuff. And then I go to work. And then in the evenings, I sit home for a couple hours every night reviewing everything that is sent to me by email. But you just have to make sure you don't get behind and you have to balance your schedule. But, but I have to realize that like, if I go home, well, well, this week's my anniversary. So I know that day when I get off work, I'm going for supper with my wife and I'm turning off my town side of things for those 10 or 12 hours. Cause I don't want that side of my life to go off the rails either. Right. I'm, I'm fortunate that my two kids are 22 and 25 now and have full-time jobs. So, I mean, when I was on council, the last time I was also coaching minor hockey, carting my son everywhere. My daughter was involved very heavily into the arts, like music and singing. So I actually, which is, sounds weird, but as mayor, this time around, I have more time for my own personal stuff than I did say in 2011 as a counselor. Uh, I want to go back to the by-election for a few minutes yes. because I, I want to talk about the jurisdictional roles that municipalities are responsible for. I hate painting this broad stroke, but I think I need to, especially across Canada right now in 2023. Mm -hmm. When you were talking to residents at the doors during that by-election, were they talking about municipal issues or were they talking about provincial and federal issues? I think there's a misunderstanding that some people may not understand the jurisdictional roles that municipalities have and play in the governmental structure. In the, the by-election, were you hearing more provincial or federal issues, or were they more aimed towards municipal issues and what was going on in the, the town? Well, right now, as you're probably aware, the big thing across North America, especially is housing. And housing is not a municipal jurisdiction whatsoever. In fact, we have no control or jurisdiction over housing. We can try to put some rules in place to make it easier for housing. We can even maybe come up with some kind of grant ideas for new builds and stuff, but you need finances to do that but as for us going out and getting housing it's not really our role so what this council has tried to do under the ccp is bring up certain pieces of land within the community that developers could possibly purchase and develop on and that has tr really tried that's almost stirred up a hornet's nest per se within the community some think it's great some think it's terrible some want to see what it's about before they even comment and that I was hearing at a lot of doors only because it's fresh and it's new. But I have heard a lot of things about like roads and sidewalks and those I mean, municipal governance is really, you know, the town's finances, public safety. So, so police and fire, roads, side, infrastructure, roads, sidewalks, water, sewer, those types of things. That's what what municipal governance is. 
is it challenging to try to explain that to people when they bring forward their issues with to you I, relatively new into the position six weeks but during that campaign period when people were talking about more overarching issues that municipalities don't really have a direct control in was it hard to say we would love i would love to address that if mayor but unfortunately the province needs to step in or the federal government needs to step in to help here it, it it's not as difficult as the biggest problem is we're the i always have said this we're the like we have the least responsibility when it comes or least power i should say the least responsibility in collecting tax dollars we have one way and that's your property tax really and but we're the closest to the people so we're the ones that you see every day we're the ones people yeah. turn to the one thing people are correct in that i might get through a door that they might not by making a call to the local mla the local mp so i can be the voice if they come to me and i you know but really as for any actual power i have none that way and, and as mayor i'm really a seventh counselor when it comes to voting i don't get like the premier gets superpowers that he can override certain bills or do certain things in the prime i don't have that control right i'm yeah. i'm a seventh counselor and it takes it's taking a while to, ex to, to explain that to some people because i can go in and, and, and express my opinions and concerns and voice my concerns at meetings but ultimately i have one vote i don't get like super votes right so you know, unless you're I'm, in ontario and you're a mayor there exactly right <laughs> and they have changed the mga in ontario to give municipal governance more power and they might be seeing now that might have been a mistake <laughs> after the green belt issue right but i mean you know that's the only thing i have to explain to people i'm going in i'm trying to in my first because my intention is obviously unless things go off the rails in the next 10 or 11 months would be to re-offer again and in August, September for a full term. I'd love to have a full term as mayor. And then I can sort of bring what my vision is and the community's vision I hear at the door is and my mandate in at that time. At this point, I'm basically just chairing meetings following the mandate that was brought in for three years now by the former mayor and trying to maybe slow some things down or maybe highlight some things that might've been missed for whatever, whatever reason. But as for that, I, the way I explain it to my, my, some of my friends on my elects, my campaign team is that I have to try to bunt out a few decent singles that people see I'm doing something and I'm getting some things done. But if I try to hit a home run right out of the gate, I'm not going to be listened to by anyone around that table. And I'm going to basically just go to, it's going to be the longest 10 or 11 months of my life. So I don't want to be, someone doing nothing so i'm trying baby steps i'm getting to know the people people around that table have to i have to earn their respect the same as they have to earn my respect right and a lot of us have never worked together and we don't know each other all we know about each other is what we've heard and what i've learned in the last six or seven weeks is some of the things i've heard it was bs right it's just a small community talk uh, and I'm glad because, like I said, we're, we're working well together and we're getting along great. And I think that we're all there for the right reasons. And I think you'll see some things done over the next four to six months that it'll be positive. And then, then at that point, we can go from there. But uh, it's definitely difficult because people come to me all the time about the hospitals. Our hospital closes a lot because of staffing. Well, I, my wife works at the hospital, right? Trust me, I have no control over the hospital whatsoever. Uh, I'm just so thankful we have a hospital in our small community that's open a lot, but it's closed sporadically and you don't know when it's going to close, but so some of our local shops because of staffing, right? I mean, you can't control that in today's world. I want to turn to the town as a whole because we're talking about it. And I want to mention this. Uh, I want to preface this question a little bit before I ask you actually ask it. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, a direction of council, or a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. And I say that because we I often get in trouble when I ask this question. I don't know yeah. why, but here we are in 2023. Um, so in your opinion, because you, you've mentioned a few already, but I want to sort of focus the interview on one or two issues here. What do you see as the biggest issue in the town today as of recording this interview? The biggest issue, quite frankly, is uh, infrastructure. And well, housing and infrastructure, but it's all combined, right? Yeah. Housing is, is probably our biggest issue. 
but it's the world's biggest issue right now. So if Jamie Meyer could solve that, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you at this from this room, right? So for my number one concern for a small community like ours, it's our infrastructure. Our infrastructure is quickly crumbling around us. And there's certain infrastructure that we can't do a lot with because of our UNESCO designation. So we have to put some serious pressure and heat on UNESCO, not to come in and give us a line item budget every year like we've asked for for 20 years, because they're never gonna do that. But we have to come in and say, these two or these three buildings or these four buildings are integral to our UNESCO designation. Like with oh, these buildings, we might lose our designation. So this is what it's going to cost. And 2000 people can't fix these buildings at that money. So either the federal government, UNESCO itself, or a combination of the feds, the province, and yes, the town. How do we get the money to fix these buildings? How do we get the money to fix this crumbling infrastructure? Because bottom line is some of these buildings we can't touch. We can, they're, they're, they're zoned a certain way under the UNESCO designation that basically handcuffs us. So there's- Can I ask a stupid question? No, go Can ahead. I ask a very stupid question right no, now? What is the benefit of having a UNESCO designation of a community like yours? UNESCO has been what's driven basically the economy for oh, 20 okay. years. So when the fishing industry, like if you look at the fishing, we were the fishing capital yeah. of Canada. So when the yeah. fishing industry crumbled, like in all the Southwest Nova Scotia and even the, the South, the coastal communities, even in the US, a lot of them small towns crumbled. Like they're not, you go there now and you can buy a house for like $150,000 and there's nothing there for business. There's like, maybe a takeout restaurant. You come to Lunenburg and we probably are the dining capital of probably Atlantic Canada. We have more nice restaurants per capita, I'm sure in any place in, in Canada. Uh, we have a lot of fine shops like stores uh, and price of houses are going for way more than my father or I ever would have dreamt. Like real estate, oh is crazy in Lunenburg. It's it's sort of it's Halifax HRM area and then Lunenburg. For, for if you move to Nova Scotia, if you want inexpensive housing, you don't come to Lunenburg because housing is really expensive right now. So I was fortunate enough to buy in 96 before we were even UNESCO. And I got a little bungalow that in any other time or, or history of the town would be a couple hundred thousand dollar bungalow. And now it's probably double that or more. And I could sell it probably overnight, right? So UNESCO has driven all that. The problem we're walking into now or, or running into is that you can't let UNESCO hold you back either. And UNESCO doesn't want to hold you back. They'll tell you the reason you're UNESCO is because you move forward in, a, in the right manner and you don't become a museum or a historical site that, you know, everybody dresses in period costume. That's not UNESCO, Right. But in order to proceed in a positive manner, we need help. You know, we the building I'm sitting in right now is crumbling around us. But it's the heart of the UNESCO designation. It's in our town, what was called the Civic Square back in the day. So this building is institutional and a lot can't be done to this building, whether we want it to or not. We can't do a lot legally. And so without a lot of help, I don't know where this building is going to go. So it sounds like there's there's a significant infrastructure issue with the community right now, but you know you can't do that on the back of the residents. You can't improve every single one of these issues, infrastructure projects, whether it be wastewater, building, road, sewage, all that, without doing it on the backs of the residents of your community already. You need partnerships. But the federal and provincial government, as much as we need them, don't come to the table as often as municipalities would potentially want with money or with even help. What do you see you have to do as mayor and as council to address the infrastructure needs today while still trying to get the province and the federal government or even UNESCO to the table to try to figure out what you can and can't do? Because as much as you want, you have to be sort of centered in reality of the here and now. Well, what we've been doing or what this group has been doing and we're continuing to do, and I might have been a little critical of it because I didn't know all the details when I was running, but they're, they're getting consultants reports on uh, what it's going to cost to do this, what's going to cost. And the reason they're getting this all in place is because you can't go to the government and say, we need this 
and it's me sitting down on a piece of loose leaf scribbling numbers together just because I talked to a couple of guys on the street, right? You need serious numbers and they want it from recognized consulting firms. So unfortunately with government, you have to spend money to get money. So we're spending money now to try to make our argument clear to them what we need moving forward. And in the meantime, we'll continue to do, I guess, what we've done for ever and we'll band-aid band -aid the problem as good as possible or as well as we can while we wait patiently for numbers to come in and meet with federal and provincial uh, colleagues. Now, don't get me wrong, since we've become UNESCO, the province and the feds have certainly came to the table for the town of Lunenburg a lot of times. Like, you know, we just got announced a, a new upgrade to our wastewater treatment plant and things like that. I mean, in my last time on council, we built a wastewater treatment plant we never had before. We built a state-of-the-art water treatment plant we never had before. And all that we, you know, we've spent probably a million dollars on our arena facility. All those projects were met with three-way splits, like us, the province, the feds. So, the, so they've been good. It's just that this time around with the magnitude of work that needs to be done, to, quite honestly, some buildings that are very, in, very important to the community. We need, we, need their, we need their help now or sooner rather than later, and we need a lot of help. Whether it's going to be there or not, I can't answer that. And what we're going to do if we don't get it, I can't answer that either. We haven't really discussed it because we don't know what the numbers are yet. Yeah. I mean, if they come back and say 10 million and you can fix it all up for that, everything's good and We'll give you a 3.3 and the, then we have to come up with three, you know, we can probably come up with $3.3 .3 million on the backs of our taxpayers. We've done it before, but we can't come up with $25 million, for example, right? Do you have developers knocking on your door? Are, are developers wanting to build in uh, Lunenburg right now? Uh, there's more development going on at this time in Lunenburg than there was when I was previously on council and in years, the problem with Lunenburg is we have, we're four square kilometers. So if you don't know yeah. Lunenburg, we're four square kilometers, with very limited space. And a lot of the development, developable space is being bought and up or taken up. And a lot of the space doesn't have services either. So without services going to it or without the capability of services getting to it, that's another issue. So, you know, we're certainly not blowing development out of the water like some of our neighbors are down the road. Like Bridgewater is one of the fastest growing, you know, towns, I think in Canada right now, which is great to see. And they're 20 minutes away. That's really I just have David but, Mitchell's David Mitchell's interview is the day before yours. <laughs> well, and it's like it's and to be honest, I mean, this is a hard thing for me to say. I'm a born and raised Lunenburg. I went to Lunenburg High School. I mean, really, Bridgewater is an extension of our community as well, or the bigger hospitals in Bridgewater. You know, if there's a major fire, the first fire department we have to call basically for backup is usually, I think, Bridgewater. You know, so in saying that, we're getting growth in this area. And we're maybe not just right in this. We're getting some growth in town, more growth in Lunenburg than we have in years. It's happened in the last three to five years. And I really think this group is working on areas to try to get even more growth. There's been some great announcements in the last month. I mean, the province just bought an old motel in the town of Winterberg to convert it into uh, housing for uh, professional healthcare workers that move here, can't find a place to live. So they're converting it into more like apartments and some smaller homes. So that's, you know, a good thing. You have Harborview Haven, which is the home for special care in Winterberg. That's up on the hill. That's moving to another area of town, brand new state of the art you know, retirement home being built in town, which again, they employ over 200 people, our biggest employer. That's not only positive in the manner that it's building a state-of-the-art building, but then it frees up the existing building that already has elevators in it, already has all kinds of things in it, rooms with bathrooms that, you know, if the province is really serious about housing, the province owns that building, that might be an area that you can put in some lower income affordable style housing in a standard. That's not our project and that that's not our, you know, but that is something the province could do at a very reasonable cost. So there's a lot happening right now in town. I mean, my mom sold her house after my dad passed and just built, bought, uh, moved into a brand new, I call them like they're, they're five like quadplexes or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. They're called townhomes or, but it's all one story, two bedroom, brand new. It opened last January, 10 of them. Right. And that developer had built about 20 of them in another area of town about five years earlier. So there is stuff happening now that wasn't even considered 12 years ago. 
So while you're sort of in this weird grace period of not wanting to run with the ball, but you want to walk with the ball to sort of catch up, learn the ropes, be the mayor, and then hopefully reoffer and get a new mandate from the electors in, in next next year. What do you see as your vision for the next year? Because a year is a long time in municipal government and things don't seem to be getting cheaper. The affordability crisis across Canada is getting only worse as we talk. Yeah. And I say that respectfully because some, some people are not struggling, but the majority of people I, I would assume are struggling and you should never assume. So what do you see as your role over the next year walking with the ball, trying to make sure that people don't struggle on the behalf of the people uh, of council's decisions? I think that what we have to do is our, our number one thing is, first of all, a year in government might seem like a long time, but if you <laughs> ever seen the wheels of government work, you know, it's not that long, right? Oh, because but compared it, to the province and the federal government, yeah, exactly. you, you guys are light years ahead of yeah. them. <laughs> like usually it takes a year to get one thing done, right? So, so right now, like, I think, you know, we're trying to reconnect. We're trying to hear what the people, oh, what I'm trying to do is hear what the people want, trying to pass it on to my colleagues. And I think we have to come up with ways that we can sell it to their residents that, hey, we're doing this for this reason and explain why we're doing it. Not just we're doing it because we can, because that's never a smart thing for any politician to say, right? You have to explain and try to sell your, your reasoning. And what we have to do is we have to try to do things that eventually if we say, if we do this, your tax rate might go from 139 to 131 or something down the road. Because your assessment, we don't control, right? The province controls that. So the only way we can bring your taxes down is by bringing your assessment down. So if we do this moving forward, this is what our vision is. But that's never really been stated. And I don't know if that's our intent or not, because we haven't really talked about that. I think the biggest eye opener for me is going to be budget time. The budget is soon going to be on the table. And once again, I had quite a bit to say at the last budget process as president of the Board of Trade. So I'll be able to express my concerns and my opinions at that time. And I've always been one to express my concerns and opinions of what I feel is best for the citizens if it might not be the best for us as a council financially, we have to find a way to make it work then. It's because the last thing I want to have anything to do with is, it's easy to say we want affordable housing. And it's easy to say we want low-income housing, but we have no control over that. This is the one thing we have control over is making the houses that we currently have and the people that we currently have living here make the rates affordable enough that people can stay in their current homes. Because the last thing we want to be is accused or being the reason people's had to move out of their homes or sell their homes because they can't afford their taxes, right? It seems like engagement is a key priority for you. Engagement with the residents. It seems like you made it a sort of a centerpiece of your election campaign. And it seems like you you want to engage with residents in the next year uh, during this last year of this mandate. Um, is there an apathy issue within Lunenburg? Like if you go out and ask people their opinion, will they actually be willing to give it to you? or it, do you find that you have to sort of like pull at the strings of uh, people to get their opinions on things that are happening in the community? No, the one thing about Lunenburg that I'll say that's unlike other neighboring municipal units is that Lunenburgers are very engaged and Lunenburgers will tell you what they think. And that's <laughs> why probably being a municipal counselor in Lunenburg, and I said this 12 years ago, is a lot tougher than being a municipal counselor, even 20 miles down the road. I mean, you know, our neighbors raised the residential tax rate two years in a row, 10 cents each year, and not a peep, not a word in letters to the editor, nothing on radio. If we would raise our residential tax rate 10 cents per hundred, we'd have to move. Like I wouldn't be able to go to work, right? <laughs> because people follow us, people are engaged, people like they really get involved. And that's, that's a good thing. And as much as I think speaking at the beginning of every meeting, giving that 20 minutes, having these open houses type of open office thing I'm having, those I think are all great. You might ask me four months from now or five months from now how good of an idea all this was. And I might say that was the dumbest thing ever because I might just get attacked, right? And I'm not, I'm hoping that that's not the case, right? I'm hoping that if I'm respectful and I'm respecting people to come in and tell me what's on their mind, they do it in a respectful manner. And, and aren't crazy right so 
So I that brings up a, that brings up a question here yeah. because I, I I talk about respect a lot on this show, and I know this this interview has gone so far off the questions that I originally sent you. No I worries. apologize for that, but I love this. Uh, respect comes both ways because you have to respect people to give their opinions, but you have to also respect them enough to listen to both sides of the story because you know on 12 years of council and now it, entering into the mayor's chair that you're never going to please a hundred percent of the people, hundred percent of the time. Right. So you have to respect them enough to be able to give them their time to be able to voice their concerns, but do it in a respectful manner. How much does that play into your decision-making when it goes at council time, or even when you're heading into this budget season, I know you're in preliminary talks right now, but how important will it be for you to listen to all sides of the equation and not just the people in your echo chamber of, okay, I, I, I know Jim from down the street and I'm going to go chat with him because we're good friends, but go talk to Sarah who might be new to town, who may not uh, know who you are or may not be aware that uh, there's a budget process going on right now. Well, I think that's the one thing I'm going to push at budget time. They had one public information session and that was after the public really complete. They were kind of any. And the public went a little bit nuts and said, and, and in, under the MGA, you don't have to have really any. So they were getting ready to pass the budget and they said, okay. And the cheer had changed at the time. And, and so I think we need to get out early. Here's the process. Come tell us what you think. Here's the budget, review it. And then we have to sit back. If we're going to ask for people's opinions, we have to be professional enough to sit down and and respect their opinions and at least discuss them. Now, if they're crazy or if they don't make any sense or we don't at the table, we agree that, you know, we can agree four to three even on stuff. Then we go with the four. I've said this before. When I sat on council before, we used to like have some really nasty meetings and it could be a four, three or five, two vote. But afterwards we all went out together and had a pop at the local nod or whatever and, and did our thing because that's how municipal politics work. And that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, what I what I disliked about things in the past was everything was six, seven, nothing, six, seven, nothing. And and that I don't think that makes for good decision making. I don't think it makes for you know a good vision in the community. You, you need to debate. And you might hear things you don't like, but when you decide to put your name on a ballot, you better have thick skin and broad shoulders. And I learned in retail a long time ago, and I and this. The public, whether you think it or not, the customer's always right. So you have to thank them and you have to be respectful and professional. And then, hey, you can sit in this room, three or four of us, and say that was dumb. But you can't say that in a meeting. That was, you know, that you have to be respectful. And we have to show that on both sides. And that goes both ways. So the one thing I'm going to try to do at budget time is if someone gets out of control publicly or someone gets out of control, even at my table, that's the only time that I'm, that that's when I will start taking my role very serious and, and laying the hammer down because nobody wins at that, really. And, and I think that this town has been, for the most part, everybody's been somewhat respectful. I never like the personal attacks on anybody because personal attacks get you nowhere. And like I said, I heard all kinds of nasty crap about all my colleagues at the table during my campaign from all kinds of people in the community and staff. And so far, staff have couldn't have been better than what they are. So they, they've been they're phenomenal. Every staff member that I have have been amazing. They've tried, to, and I only really am supposed to have interaction directly with one staff person, the CAO. The rest work for him technically, but they all enter. It's a small town, right? So I mean, right from Kelly at the office to Michael, my communications officer, they've all went out of their way to make my job as easy as possible and smooth as possible. Jamie's been phenomenal, and the same with my colleagues. So this isn't the big nightmare that I was convinced that I was walking into, and I think that. In retrospect, they're seeing that I'm not this vicious animal that's coming in there and, you know, yelling and screaming at people. And, you know, I'm not Gordon Ramsay in Hell's Kitchen, right? Like, you know, it's a, I'm a much different guy. If that was the case, I'm assuming Jamie probably wouldn't have said, maybe you should interview the man. Right, <laughs> exactly. Said, maybe you should just pass. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we just we went for lunch today, him and I. We get along great, right? I mean, I've learned, and that's probably my strongest asset. I mean, probably my strongest asset are my skills to connect with people. Uh, I always say I can go anywheres, 
you can send me anywhere. And within 10 minutes, I'll know people at my table or I'll know people or I'll be out with these guys afterwards having a beer because that's who I am. And that's who I've always been. So I can connect with people very easy. So you want to come talk to me, I'll, you know, and, I, and the only thing I don't like and I won't put up with is if someone starts yelling and screaming like a wild man to me or a crazy man, I'll just say enough is enough. Like I jokingly said, when I announced these meetings starting this Friday, I'm going to have two before the holidays and I hope to have some more in the new year. But if the RCMP get called, that'll probably be the end of it, right? And everybody laughed, right? But, you know, if I have to pick up this phone and hit the button that says RCMP, then these sessions are probably ended, right? Because I just, for my own health and stress, I just can't handle that because I, my switch can be flipped too at times. And I definitely can't let allow that to happen in my position right now. So... So I, I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time and we're at the 40 minute mark. I said 40 minutes. So I'm going to try and get through this segment as quickly as possible with you. But I want to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's tourism. I think municipalities play a massive role in tourism. And I'm imagining being a UNESCO designated community, tourism is massively important to you as well. So as someone who will be coming through Nova Scotia in possibly spring, summer of 2024, visiting Lunenburg, because I've promised anyone who comes on my show, I will visit your community. I want to know, what are the hidden treasures? What are the tourist hotspots that people need to see if they come to the town of Lunenburg? You have to go see the Academy. You have to try to get in and get through it. It's an incredible <laughs> building. I went there till grade five. My mom went there right through, I think, to grade 11 or 12. And it's it's a great, great building. That's up at the Castle on the Hill. You want to see the Anglican Church that was rebuilt in 2001 after the devastating fire. But it's rebuilt to its exact replica of when it was built. It was one of the oldest, second oldest maybe Anglican Church in Canada. You want to see the museum and you want to spend two to four hours in the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic. It's beautiful. It has an aquarium. And the number one thing you'd really want to do is you want to make sure the blue nose is important when you're here and you want to book because you got to book way in advance. You want to book an afternoon sale on the blue nose too. It's not cheap. It's like, I don't know, 95 or a hundred bucks, but what you, you want to go on the blue nose too. It's a two and a half hour sail out through the Harbor. You'll get to see that when you come in, you'll get to see the, the town that you see flying into you used to see it. I don't know if it's still there, but in, in Disney, when you were in uh, Epcot or whatever it was in Disney there, when you went in, when you flew into Canada and through Canada, you yeah. flew in the Harbor of Lunenburg and flew out of Vancouver, which is kind of cool. So when you flew into Canada, it was the town of Lunenburg when you flew in. And I was there in 2010 and it was there, but I haven't been there since. But it, it's but that's that's what you'll see. Those are the four or five highlights. And then if you like waves, and you're from Alberta. Uh, yeah, originally from Ontario, but currently stationed in Calgary. Well, if you want to see ocean and, and waves and things, uh, Peggy's Cove is phenomenal. Don't get me wrong, but Peggy's Cove is very commercialized. And it's, you know, it's in between Halifax and Lunenburg, right? Peggy's Cove is a must-see. But if you don't get to see that, uh, when you drive through Lunenburg, you go to an area called Blue Rocks, Stonehurst area. It's very similar to the Peggy's Cove community. If it's windy, you'll see the waves crashing on the rocks. There's little fishing shacks. There's inshore fishing boats, lobster boats everywhere. It's a real true fishing community. That's where my mom's actually from. You'll see real a real fishing community, but there's no gift shop. There's no restaurant. There's no stores. It's it's just, in fact, the locals, if they ever watch this, will hate me for telling you to get on there because they don't like guys like me sending people down there because the pictures are beautiful, right? But that's where my grandfather and grandmother on my mom's side, uh, that's where they grew up, like my- Oh, wow. So, so it's beautiful. You'll love that area. And those are really your four or five big highlights. And then, and then what you'll like, depending if you have children with you or not, uh, what you'll, Lunenburg, actually, if you're here in the summer, you'll be amazed on especially Thursday, Friday night. There's no other town, I don't think, in Atlanta, can you can walk on Pelham Street, uh, not Pelham, Montague Street, and there's probably 10, 12 restaurants there. They'll, every one of them have a lineup. There's neat little spots you should have specialty drinks there's other little spots you know especially this there's some ice cream places it's just like the the town is bustling like for two months of the year in that area and it's almost as much happening in that area for a couple hours every night as you'll see in certain areas of halifax but an older crowd it's not 
my daughter's age, not a bunch of 21 year olds hanging out to get into a pub. It's guys my age or whatever, waiting to go in with his partner or whatever and have a drink and maybe an appy. It's, it's just a nice, you'll love the community. The, the, the only thing I'll advise you is if you're thinking of coming, you should plan ahead because right now we have less and less accommodations than we ever had. One of our hotels sold. Oh, being, we're, we're RVing it. We are RVing, RVing across Canada. Well, then if you RV it, then you contact the Board of Trade. Uh, and you ask to speak to Candace. Because I was the president of the Board of Trade for three and a half years. You ask to speak to Candace. And you tell them that Mayor Meyer told you to come that way. Because we'll, you stay up that area. Stay on the, stay on the hill. Because yeah. you can park your RV. We have fire pits now. We're just, we just, they just renovated their bathrooms. And you can walk to anywhere you want in town. So oh, if you want to go down and have a, like Ironworks Distilleries 500 yards away, you want to go down and do a sample of that or do it, you know, if we're able to driving anywhere. Tourists love staying there that RV it because half the time they don't unhook their cars from the back of the RV if they have cars with them. So that's where you want to stay. Okay. We'll certainly do that. But where do you go? Where, where's the, where's your escape in the community? Where do you go to decompress, let it all go, knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back at it with your day job as a business owner, as the mayor and council meetings and meetings with ministers, meetings with federal agencies. Where do you go to just let it all go? There's a number of spots. There's about four different, I call them like their pubs or restaurants and all all four of them that, that I would go to on a regular basis, I know the staff very well. So I can go there after work and have a quick pop or two before I go home, let my hair down. Or in the summer, really, it's the golf course. I'm a huge Ooh. golfer. I have I have the course. So not nine or 18, I've got to ask. Only a nine-hole <laughs> course, but it has like five different holes that have back nine tees differently. So I hold the course record over here, right? So uh, so I, I've that's where I... Work. I think that's a challenge if I've ever yeah. heard one. Yeah, Let's well, do you it. can look me up and I'll take you golfing. I have a cart. But I go over there and sit in the clubhouse. I know all the guys. I know all the staff. And that's really in the summer it's the go- is the golf course for sure. In the winter, to be honest, I am I guess it's my age. I'll go home and my wife and I will usually sit out on my back deck. If it's not too cold, I have a propane fire pit and a wood fire pit. I actually have a TV out of my deck and we'll turn it on TV under the gazebo, have a drink or two and just relax. And I try to this, these last little while, like I've been doing work on every night I go home for the last six weeks, trying to get caught up with, you know, I'm trying to read the updated MGA and I'm trying to, you know, cause the MGA is definitely a different beast. It, it, it actually gives Jamie Doyle has way more power than I do as the CAO than, than I do as mayor, which a lot of, people don't quite understand but it's done for a reason because you know jamie's the one hired to make sure things are done properly and running smoothly and the last thing you'd want is seven you could have seven people with no experience another time around you could really get to town and some some trouble right i mean there's some serious decisions we have to make moving forward in the next little while and and it's going to be tough on a new council if some of it's not done because like the, the biggest issue will be our electric utility. And that was an issue in 2010 and still an issue in 2023. And it's going to be an issue until we decide what we're going to do with our electric utility, right? Because we own our own utility, but we don't run it anymore. And it's, we've contracted out to NSPI. Oh, okay. So that can't go on forever. So people in the community that know nothing about the electric utility think that we should just, you know, buy a truck and hire two electrical guys and start up our own utility again. Well, we had a hard time keeping staff in 2010 because we can't compete with the big players. So until we know if it's possible or not, again, I don't think we know what direction we're headed in, but we have to make that decision sooner rather than later. But it's a very tough decision. Does so, that come with a big check as well? I'm assuming. Oh, if we sell the utility, we'll get some money. Yes. No, I, but if it be as, if you sell it, yes, you're probably going to get it. But if we money, keep it, it's going to come. Yeah. If, if we keep it, it's going to be millions to keep. Yeah. <laughs> you see, when we gave up our utility, we kept our utility, but didn't, I guess, back in 2016 or 17, they decided they couldn't find staff. So the contract out to NSPI. And then within a year or so, they decided this is going pretty good. So they sold all their capital. So they sold the big pole truck and the little, which is great. And they did projects back at that time with that money. But now, like a pole truck is probably half a million dollars because you know, everything costs so crazy now. A, a, a half, a good half ton is a hundred thousand dollars, right? Or quarter ton, right? So, so that's, 
that's what we're looking at. And then the general public just thinks, thinks it's simple, which I would think if I wouldn't have sat at this table for 12 years previously. And I well, it goes back to that apathy, right? As, like, yeah. as long as my water's turned on and my my garbage is picked up, I'm happy. Right. And and that's the way a lot of communities are. And, and a lot of people are like that in town, but a lot of people are really involved in town, like I said. So so it's good. It's good to have an active, engaged community. I mean, we we fill the town cham- hall chambers almost every meeting now. And wow. I might think that's getting a bit old six months from now, maybe. But right now, I think it's great. Right. And, and everybody's very professional, very respectful. And and most of them were my supporters at the last election. So I have to be very careful because, you know, it's it is what it is. Right. It's a small community. Can I just say and this is completely off topic for a little bit here, but I watched your October 10th council meeting just recently and I was watching and the very I think it was the second person who gave a speech uh, how they were comparing Germany to or Amsterdam to <laughs> I was like this is what happens in small town uh, council meetings right here right now. This is the best of council meetings where someone could just get up and just talk and just well, and and they, <laughs> they're supposed to have three minutes. They yeah. spoke for seven and my colleagues are like wanting me to use the gavel or freak out. So then when it was all, when all four of them were finished speaking, I just had that little speech at the end that I really like this session. I'm glad this council put it in, but we have to be respectful on both sides because if not, they'll take it away. It's that simple. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but I wasn't going to cut anyone off. Like you have to know your role and read the room. And if I had cut them off, that would have went over like a lead balloon at my third meeting, ever, you know, running. Right. So, you know, maybe if I was there for 12 years, I might've cut them off, but. Uh, So I'm going to end on my last question here, and it's kind of the million dollar question, because I think every municipal politician needs to know how to answer this. And I think they do know how to answer this. But I like asking it because I like to learn a little bit more. In your opinion, what makes the town of Lunenburg such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? I think it's quaintness. It's it's safety. It's. uh... The fact that we have so much here for such a small community, our recreational facilities are second to none. Our brand new school, P to nine, is state of the art. Uh, we have great people working here. We have great people that run. We have great shops. It's just, in my opinion, we have our own hospital. We have our own like like rink, curling rink, golf club, tennis court, bowling alley. Uh, uh, we even have cricket here now. We have, you know, we have everything you can think of, a swimming pool, tennis club. Uh, we have everything you want, and we're 55 minutes away from HRM. So if you really want to go to the rock concert of the year, or if you want to go to a World Junior game when it's in Nova Scotia, you're 55 minutes away. And then you can go into the hustle and bustle and get freaked out for a night or whatever. But if you want to leave your basement door unlocked, you want to leave your keys in your car, as crazy as this sounds, you can still do it in the town of Lindenburg. Wow. Right? And that's and that's what I tell everybody. Uh, you know, uh, we have, and I shouldn't say this too loud, but our crime rate is, like, we don't have crime. Like people complain because we have illegal parking happening, which is annoying, but illegal parking and if that That's the thing, biggest issue that your community has. That's the crime. biggest legal <laughs> issue right now, right? You know, and, and, Knock on wood, I have two young adult kids, so they're grown up, but we've we've seemed to be able to avoid to a certain degree some of the other issues that bigger towns are having right now, too, with some of the other issues with the youth and that. Like it's maybe because we don't have a high school, the high school is 20 minutes down the road now. But we just have a great community. I lived here my entire life, couldn't wait to move when I graduated from high school, went to St. Mary's for year and a half and then moved back here. I went to NSCC in Bridgewater and realized after I got in the city that the city life is great. If you're, you know, if I was 18 or 19, I'd want to move back to the city for a year, but the city is great for where it is. It's 55 minutes away and it's only going to get quicker because they're dividing the highway the whole, you know, every day. So you drive in, you get a hotel room for a night, you do what you want to do and you come back to, to this. And it's just, you know, it, it's just, it, I think it's a, one of the most beautiful communities on the planet. And I've been a lot of places. Now in saying that I'm probably hitting to Calgary in June and going to Banff for a couple of days before I come home. And I've been told by my sister who just came back that I'll want to move there when I get there. 
you, you'll want to move there and then you get here and then you go okay maybe not because there's a lot of tourists there. <laughs> that's someone yeah. from who who goes to banff on a regular basis and i shouldn't say that because i i love banff and banff's a yeah. great community i love the mayor there as well but there's my little plug um jamie i want to thank you I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. I, I know in our, our conversation, you said usually you're doing business stuff right now for your other job, but thank you so much for taking time out of that and sitting down and talking about your community and talking about yourself. Well, thank you for doing this. And I mean, I, I'm very fortunate. We have a, a, a lady that uh, that's worked with us now for probably 18, 19 years. We started with my dad and I. And I always joke because the reason we hired her because we knew her husband, her, we knew her ex-husband at the time and we knew she was a Leafs fan. And my father and I are big Leafs fans, so we hired her and that's sort of a joke. And she slowly became a Bruins fan. So I used to always pick on her and say, you know how close you are to when the Bruins knocked out the Leafs, you know how close you are not having a job, joking with her. But she has been the savior of the business in the last three years with the, uh, with the health of my, with the deteriorating health of my dad year and a half two years ago i missed a lot of time when he was in the city and different the, she basically ran the store and then i campaigned in the middle of the summer which you know what goes on in lunarburg in the middle of the summer it's only a tourist town right so she was basically running the show when i was out knocking on doors and she's there today running the show so she she's de definitely getting close to her stage life where she probably wants to work less and she's working more and she never complains so that's what a small, and I have two or three other people that have retail experience that have come in and worked an afternoon here and an afternoon there with her just to help me out. So that's what a small community is all about. But I have to, I can't go without mentioning her because we wouldn't be open if it wouldn't be for her right now. We'd have closed when my dad was ill. So, right. The, the, the spirit of a small town seems alive and well in Lunenburg. Um, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate well, it. Thank you very much. And you make sure if you come down this summer that you stop in and see me and I might flip you an email down the road because I'm I'm planning attending the FCM conference in June. And that's in Calgary this year, June 6th to the 9th. So I plan on taking my wife and extending in a couple of days and going to Banff because I might never get there again. So it's what better way to go. I get my way there and back, you know, flight paid for by the town anyways. So I might as well go pay for my wife to come and enjoy it so well if you guys need a tour guide to out to banff we're happy to drive you out there to tour you around banff and leave you there for a few days if you want that'd be wonderful thank you very much thank you for joining us for another great episode of the cross-border interviews your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross-Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.